Good evening. I'm James Traub, and welcome to Ethics Matter. Our guest tonight is Anthony Romero, the director of the American Civil Liberties Union. Uh, Anthony became director of the ACLU seven days before 9-11, which turned out to be an incredibly propitious time to take a job like that. 9-11, uh, I think, has shown Americans uh, threats to their civil liberties, which I think many people hadn't thought about for half a century or, or more. Anthony, thank you for My being pleasure, here My pleasure, Jim. Thank you for having me. So well, first, am I right in thinking that 9-11 uh, was kind of, a, kind of a, a, a great moment for the ACLU, if you can put it that way? <laughs> We're like undertakers. We do well in times of plague. Yeah. Um, we have lots of work to do. Uh, but the events of 9-11 fundamentally transformed our country and, of course, my organization. We are now celebrating our 95th year this year. And we were founded at a time very similar to the time I inherited in my first week on the job. And at the earliest moments of the ACLU, we were founded right after the Palmer Raids, when a series of bombs went off across this country, one even on the doorstep of the Attorney General at the time, Mitchell Palmer. And he concerned with the enemy within, with this violence that was erupting on our doorstep, on his doorstep, literally unleashed the full fury of the Justice Department to find those who would rip apart our fabric of society. And in that time, they targeted uh, the labor movement, anarchists, so-called anarchists, uh, socialists, communists, many immigrants, and summarily deported close to 5,000 individuals without due process. And it was precisely at that time that a young group of well, uh, intentioned, wonderfully aspirational, young in their 20s, uh, individuals mostly from well-heeled families, said we need to found an organization that def we would defend the rights of all people, uh, everyone in America. And so our founder, Roger Baldwin, was joined by some of the great suffragists at the time. Uh, Margaret Sanger, who went on to found Planned Parenthood, Crystal Eastman, Jane Addams, Helen Keller was one of our founders. And we were founded with the premise that, that we needed to be able to, as a, as a people, have bodies that would stand up to government uh, abuse and excessive authority. And so out of the Palmer Raids, we were born. Over the years, there were many iconic moments for us, Japanese-American internment being one, also times of war when fear and scapegoating got the better of our civil liberties. We challenged uh, the internment of 120,000 Japanese Americans, two-thirds of whom were American citizens. We brought that case all the way up to the Supreme Court in 1941. We filed it. 1944, we lost it. Three of the great liberals of, of American democracy in the 20th century, FDR, who signed the order, Hugo Black, who was on the Supreme Court, Earl Warren uh, in California. And it was a moment when, again, in times of fear and insecurity, we sometimes make decisions we come uh, to regret. It's a very vivid way. I hadn't realized that until you said it. It's a very vivid way of illustrating the politics of the moment when national security and civil liberties are seen in tension. I mean, I, one of the things I take from your having said that is that defending civil liberties is an intrinsically minoritarian pursuit. It, it does not matter the, the party that's in power. Uh, and well-intentioned, well-meaning leaders will sometimes make the wrong decisions for the wrong reasons. And history is quickly forgotten. And in our, in our organization, we, we understand the history and we think the history informs what we do going forward. And in fact, it was those lessons of the earlier years of the ACLU that helped me understand just how vigorous we had to be in, in being vigilant and being skeptical of some of the arguments and policies that were put in place in the immediate aftermath of 9-11. You had just become director then. And here you are, you're an organization in New York. You were all New Yorkers. You would live through this. Yeah. We so, were all the way down near the World Trade Center. Our office was closed for several weeks. Oh, is that true? Oh, yes. So this was a really intensely personal One of our board thing. members died in the World Trade Center. I hadn't realized that. Yeah. So we felt it personally, directly, as New Yorkers, as 
individuals in the city as Americans. And then as civil libertarians, we also understood that we needed to not pull our punches. Well, so Anthony, that's what I want to get at, because I'm curious. How much internal debate was there in the aftermath of 9-11? Because things like the Patriot Act happened quite quickly. Right, right. How much internal debate was there amongst you on the question of, is our job to try to make the right balance between these two things, or is our job to stand up for this thing because nobody else is? It's funny, because there really was a very little dissent about the need for our being strong enough to stand up to some of the government arguments. It was more a question of tactics initially and timing. I remember my first week on the job right after when 9-11 hit on 9-12, I issued my very first press statement to the public. And it was one where we grieved the loss of life. We talked about the importance of American values. Um, I think I remarked upon the metaphor of the Statue of Liberty. I see the Statue of Liberty from my office. It's somewhat poetically appropriate. And I, I talked about the need for being mindful of defending freedom and liberty in times of fear and insecurity. There were some who thought I was, I was being a little bit shy in the beginning. And there were some of my strident members of the organization who were perhaps a bit critical, who wanted me to jump right ahead and say, talk about the civil liberties violations that we know will come. And I was of a mind, um, and I'd like to think I was right in retrospect, that you needed to meet the American public where they were. And that on September 12th, we all needed to grieve the loss of life and remind ourselves what made us proud to be Americans. And that as soon as things began to change in policies and laws, in government practices, then we come out uh, full. But wait, what, what does it mean? That's an interesting expression, to meet the American people where they were. Because after all, when people are polled about, for example, torturing uh, uh, mm. alleged terrorists, people say, yeah, you know, Jack Bauer does that and it works. Yeah. So uh, I, mean, I guess it, it raises a couple questions. One is, how long do you think it took? It took a month. Before, a month before people began having the reaction we have to think about our liberties as well as our security. That's what I mean. How long before that? Yeah, reaction no, it set happened in? within a month. In fact, I mean, we have the Patriot Act that was the first legislative response to the events of 9/11 that was enacted uh, 30 some odd days after the events. And that went through instantly. There was no, no opposition. Very little debate. Many of the proposals that we had been fighting off for years were pulled off the shelf, and then dusted off with a, a fine veneer of anti-terrorism. Uh, patina, and then forced through Congress with very little discussion or debate. Even well-intentioned, wonderful defenders of civil liberties and civil rights would tell me privately, Anthony, this is not the time when we can raise these questions. I remember having this conversation with Senator Paul Wellstone right before his plane went down, where I said, Paul, how could you have possibly have voted for the Patriot Act? What are you thinking? You know what's in there. It's a ticking time bomb. You've given the executive branch such extensive powers. We will come to regret this. He, and he would say, he said to me a month before he died, he said, I understand, but this was not a time where I felt I could raise those questions at the beginning. Um, I'm in a tight race. Let me get through my race. We'll get you on the hill, and we'll start repealing aspects of this law. And then he died. And then he died. Yeah. But wait, certainly on, on, on torture issues, the moment Abu Ghraib happened, suddenly this became an inescapable public issue. But on the Patriot Act issues, was there really much of a groundswell prior to Edward Snowden's revelations? Yeah, there were moments. The Patriot Act quickly became uh, radioactive among some members of the public. It was the, the, the very... Um, marketing, PR naming of the act, I think, turned a lot of people off. Really smart people began to really curl their thought, you know, curl their nose at the idea that we'd name something the Patriot Act like this. And then in it were all sorts of law enforcement powers which weren't really fully debated by Congress. In fact, not debated at all. No hearings, no, no testimony. Uh, and so there were moments, there were crescendos. And then over time, the American people would get accustomed to a new normal. And it wasn't only until the revelations of Edward Snowden that in the last two years began to reignite again uh, the, these questions around surveillance. Let's just sort of go through the process of what's happened a little bit, because after the Snowden revelations, President Obama impaneled a commission to look at first the 
claims of whether it was actually the case that, that this NSA metadata, the bulk collection system, had done any good, had prevented acts of terrorism as the government claimed, and then what should be done. So a lot of people in your community were really disappointed that while the commission concluded that it hadn't done any good, they could not point to a specific case, neither did they seek they didn't call for an end to bulk collection. They said it shouldn't be held by the NSA. It should be held by a third party. But now Obama, I, w I went back to look at the speech he gave when he received the report. And something I hadn't remembered, he said, in effect, well, actually, there's an instance where it could have prevented 9-11 because Khalid al-Midar, who was one of the hijackers living in, in San Diego, made a call to a known al-Qaeda phone number in Yemen. And so Obama cited this fact to yeah. say, well, of course, we need to have this ability to collect calls from the United States to uh, places abroad because that can lead us to uncover terrorist plots. We find that our president often contradicts himself. Uh, <laughs> and he mumbles a, a defense of civil liberties and uh, a defense of the series of checks and balances that we think are essential. I think if we go back and look, and if you go back and look at the most thorough review of the breakdown, was the of the breakdown of intelligence gathering, uh, was the 9/11 uh, Commission report. That was probably the most thorough and the most thoughtful. It was a report that we helped staff through members of the Commission. They were bipartisan. They spent years, millions of dollars of taxpayer money. And what's also clear is that one of their primary conclusions was was that the greatest challenge America had was not that it wasn't collecting all the data it needed, is that even with the data we collected, we failed to connect the dots. And so it makes the point that when you're looking for the needle in the haystack, which is essentially what you're doing in national security matters, when you're trying to do this type of intelligence gathering, and you're looking for that one needle in the haystack, it's very hard to find the one needle where you keep adding more hay onto the haystack. You put it diplomatically by saying that our president mumbles um, about civil liberties. But I assume that for you and for the ACLU, this is an unbelievable disappointment. You have a president sure. who was a professor of constitutional law, sure. a president who in his, I remember the speeches when he was campaigning, Me he too. talked about, we're going to put an end to the color-coded politics of fear, all that stuff. He believes in transparency, believes in accountability. So, okay, so the, the question that I think this leads to is, unless you think the guy is just a hypocrite and a liar, I think the more interesting question is, what does that tell you? that when you get the president, you would almost try, you would almost have to design artificially to create such a likely person. That person gets in office and pursues those policies. It is a conundrum. One has to scratch one's head about how is it possible that a president who ran on a very clear agenda on the set of national security matters could be so off. Right? In other areas, he's been terrific. In other areas, like voting rights issues, or lesbian and gay rights issues, or questions around uh, poverty or health care reform. All of those, I think, are enormous wins, from my perspective, that the president has championed. But in the context of national security, whether it's surveillance, or Guantanamo, or the prosecution of those who committed torture, or the use of drones, this is a president that looks a lot like his predecessor that there's not substantive difference in many of the major policies and priorities when you compare him to that and George so Bush. So why? Why? There isn't a voting constituency attached to these issues. He, he would be good on LGBT rights because he's a con law professor and he believes in civil rights issues and he believes it in his blood. He also has a constituency of people who will hold his feet to the fire on LGBT issues. On the same like abortion and choice, same on questions around poverty and health care. There is not an easily identifiable voting block that will vote or not vote a certain way when it comes to NSA surveillance, Guantanamo, and drones. Can I suggest, I want to ask you an alternative hypothesis. 
there's an interesting book that Stephen Carter, who's a yeah. law professor yeah. at Yale, wrote That's the called second the, theory, the right. Violence of Peace. He said, it might be that Obama the insider, meaning as president, has realized what Obama the outsider did not. Whatever the mistakes of his predecessor, President Bush acted out of a belief in the urgency of the threat facing the nation. The threat was neither invented nor imagined, but is instead out there in the world. And so Obama every day gets one of these terrifying intelligence sure. briefings and suddenly thinks, oh, it's worse than I realized. And, and that's what I also hear is true. I hear from friends who are very close to the administration, the president, and the White House, that he was very much captured by the intelligence community, that they put the fear of God quite literally in him with these daily terrorist briefings and national security briefings. And I think there we have to be mindful of the fact that th we would want our executive branch and our president to be very skeptical, not because he doesn't want the intelligence communities to do their job and do it well, but you want someone who's going to be very probing and ensure that they go back and do their homework twice or thrice if necessary. And I will also go a step further. I mean, I've met the president twice only, uh, once in a private meeting that was rather extended and once just a very casual uh, And did meeting. you tax him with this stuff? And this... Oh, we clashed. Yeah. We clashed. I was summoned to the White House. And it was, it, it was billed as he wants to hear from outside the bubble. He and this wants... was when? What year was this? Oh, it was about a two years after he was first in the office. Okay. And we were brought in to give him an outside perspective. We were brought in to be put in line. And it was pretty clear that it was less about him hearing us and more about him hearing, about us hearing him. And he was really quite piqued that some of the criticisms we had made, even at that early point, he thought were unfair and would be best left unsaid or muted. And, and I think, in, in, you know, in the end, there's a certain um, arrogance, and I say that with all due respect to the office of the president and to a man I voted for, uh, that he thinks himself to be best to make these hard decisions. That certainly the, the, the burden of the responsibility falls on his shoulders. And certainly he has, the, the buck stops with him in every quintessential way. But the idea that, therefore, he is then best situated to make these hard calls, I find it astonishing, for instance. This is where I can only get to the arrogance factor. I, that the New York Times ran this great big expose about the drone program, the very first article that came out, where unnamed White House sources talked about the, the kill list, what we call the kill list, how they identify whom to target with unmanned drones for execution either near the battlefield or off the battlefield, like in Yemen. And in the New York Times, you hear the story about how the president himself would agonize over the dossiers of who would be on these kill lists, said high-named White House source. I found that chilling. You know, in most of my studies of American history, we work very hard to make sure that the president's fingerprints are never on dossiers that our covert agencies decide who should be executed. Wait, I'm sorry, executed. Is, it, is it better or worse that his view is if we're going to kill somebody, I, I as the president have to take responsibility I think, for I that? I think it's a level of um, you have to let the processes of government with a robust series of checks and balances, the cabinet of rivals who will fight each other, who will give you the best decisions and recommendations rather than you making the decisions. So this would be like things. LBJ picking at bombing targets exactly. in Vietnam. Exactly. It's, it's, it's astonishing to me. And it's astonishing, especially in the context of some of these very difficult cases that we have been deeply involved with. The case of Anwar Alaki, an American citizen who was targeted for drone assassination um, by the American government, leaked out to the press. Uh, months and months before they actually succeeded in, 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 in killing him. And he was in Yemen, not in a declared battlefield, but the battlefield and the war on terror is everywhere, anyone everywhere. And when his father, um, Nasser Alaki, came to us, who's, Nasser is, a, is an American permanent resident, studied in, uh, in the United States, 
had read the reports that his son was being hunted by his own government, came to us and said, how can America be trying to execute my son in Yemen? He's not been convicted of a crime. He's not been, uh, he's had no due process. Now we're throwing all the power of the US Defense Department and the CIA against him. Isn't there something you can do, Anthony? And so we endeavored to bring a case asking that there be some adjudicating balancing of equities. There's got to be someone other than one person or a group of individuals given the carte blanche to decide. Well, let me stop you right there because I mean, I'm, I myself don't totally understand why there should be such a hard and fast legal and moral distinction between the targeted killing of an American and the targeted killing of an American. No, I think, I think ethically yeah. and morally that line is non-existent. But then you, you would say there should, one shouldn't use drones. One shouldn't and, have targeted killings. No, I think, I think in certain instances you could. It's a question of whether you could do it in a place like Yemen where it is not a declared battlefield. It, places like Pakistan or Afghanistan on the border where there has been the authorization of use of military force, where Congress has at least sanctioned the use of military force is quite another matter. Just another matter when you go to a, a theater where there is no declared war in place. But the, the reason why we focused, and again, Mr. Mr. Alaki's father came to us and we brought that case is because we have certain protections for US citizens that you don't have for Pakistani citizens in American courts. I mean, it's not because any one life is worth more than another. It's just under the legal context, an American citizen can claim certain rights in the courts under the Fourth and Fifth Amendment that a Pakistani would be very hard to do. But if, if this American citizen, Anwar al awlaki it turns out to have been somebody who was both rhetorically, inspirationally, and also perhaps far more yeah. directly, causing the death of many people, including many Americans, and there was no easy way of seizing him. It was possible, but extremely difficult. Then why is it so obviously wrong because, to engage in targeted killing? Because you have to unpack the legal standard first. I mean, we are able to take that type of extreme action of unilateral execution, if you will, uh, if, the, if the target poses an imminent threat mm -hmm. to the nation, right? And it's got to be credible and imminent being the operative word. The, the way the facts of this particular case were, are very hard to allege that the threat was imminent. When you have the ability to put him on a list for eight or nine months, the ACLU can be contacted by the man's father, we bring a lawsuit, we're in federal court, and then they still succeed at killing him. The imminence of that threat seems a bit attenuated in my mind. We don't know because we don't know the circumstances behind it. I think it's also true from an ethical perspective, and, and I've had this debate with, with, uh, with members of the government, those who will see me. Um, That's not so many of them, I gather, so after it's shrinking, the president chewed shrinking you out. every year. Yeah. Uh, we don't allow for the fact that people change. Uh, I grew up Catholic. I grew up learning the, the, both the Old Testament and what we call the New Testament. And I remember one of my favorite stories was Saul on the road to Damascus. I was entranced by this story. You know, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And the idea that you could be stopped on a road and something could inspire you to change your mind and then you change your life. How were we ever to know that Anwar al-Awlaki was never struck with that Saul on the road to Damascus moment. And even if he had been kind of an operative or someone who had been a spokesperson for Al-Qaeda, how do we know that the moment of his death, he hadn't changed but his you, point you're of describing view? this, I mean, I'm, this is, I'm very interested in this, because you're describing it as if, as if this is a matter of capital punishment, and the man's soul was being judged. And I think it's, that's but, why. But, that, wait, that's, but the issue, I think, is it is true of this man or any man it's true. That, his, that his or her life is never unraveled till the very end. It's always a mystery. But if a person is, is made himself an enemy and a combatant, doesn't the question of his soul become a, a, an unaffordable luxury? But I think as, as a, in a legal system that often tries to find mitigating circumstances when we do use 
capital punishment as an extreme case, and you have to understand my organization doesn't believe in capital punishment in any circumstance. Yeah. Right? We don't believe it for anyone. Right. Me neither, but I see the distinction between and, these but things. Part of, what you're, part of what you allow in a legal system, even the one which we don't fully agree with, is that you allow for the weighing of certain equities. And when you decide to put someone on a target list and you hunt them for over a year, and you don't allow for anyone to adjudicate the equities, the balances, the, the, kind of the, the character, the temperament, the change of circumstances. You don't allow for the type of, 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 of guarantees. What if you got it wrong? What if they actually got it wrong? And they did absolutely get it wrong, you know, in what context? When they killed Mr. Alaki's son. Yes. A 16-year-old right. boy, American citizen, who said, I want to find dad. Where, where did dad go? I'm going to go to Yemen. I'm going to see where dad went. The little boy went hunting his father because he wanted to have a connection with dad. And this little American citizen, you have to watch him on video, was out there trying to connect with his father. And another one of these drone strikes that had gone away killed the son of Anwar Alaki. Now, no one, no one says that he was an Al-Qaeda operative or a high-level high Al-Qaeda individual, he just happened to be wondering, what happened to dad? And let me go find him in our home country. And I think that's why you want to have mechanisms that, that put constraints around the, this most, the, the most awesome use of executive power, the ability to be judge, jury, and executioner in the context of individual life of American citizens, not on a battlefield. Anthony, that was really, that was fabulous. Thank you so much. That was great. For more on this program and other Carnegie Ethics Studio productions, visit carnegiecouncil.org. There you can find video highlights, transcripts, audio recordings, and other multimedia resources on global ethics. This program is made possible by the Carnegie Ethics Studio and viewers like you.